Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? You see the screen? Okay, well, thanks for coming out. And um, this is a, kind of an interesting topic for me. I'm uh, very interested in the relationship between sports and, and fans, and in particular, what makes this such a unique type of business. It is big business, there's big money in it, but if you think about the outsized footprint that sports occupies in our lives, um, why not some other industry that's just as large? For example, the uh, architectural woodworking industry is roughly the same size as the sports industry. And yet, you know, the back page of the Press Gazette is not dedicated to different kinds of woods. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I figured I'd start off uh, and talk a little bit about uh, you know, the, the history of spectator sports in general. And talk about the size of the thing, and then talk about, in particular, women's uh, role in here, uh, role with this, and maybe we can have some time for questions. But uh, spectator sports have been around for a long, long time. And if we look at the archaeological evidence, we find that as soon as uh, groups of people had enough wherewithal to feed themselves and not have to spend 24-7 chasing mastodons and the like uh, to eat, uh, that we had art, Drama, music come about at the same time that sports uh, does. And you can imagine this, okay? Um, I'm sure that as soon as someone figured out that they could throw a rock, the person, uh, guys being who they are, who could throw the rock the farthest, and uh, people being what they are, I would imagine they, the one who could throw the rock the farthest probably got a fair bit of positive attention. And so it's almost impossible to separate out sports from any other cultural entity that we have, although I think we probably think about art and music and drama maybe being, being on a higher plane, uh, but they're part of the same animal. Um, here in the United States, um, of course, we were founded by Puritans, and Puritans were not in love with sports at all. <laughs> and, and I really enjoy these, uh, the stories about, uh, about that. Uh, and when I was uh, doing a, a book a couple of years ago, my uh, wife, Terry, who's, who's here, uh, had the uh, misfortune of having to read all the drafts. And some of them were pretty god-awful. And she gave very you know, positive uh, feedback, but made the point. I had a long thing in there about you know, the Pilgrims and King James and uh, Cromwell and all that sort of thing about uh, their relationship with sports. And it went on for maybe more pages than it should. And uh, so Terry's advice was, kill the pilgrims. <laughs> <laughs> and now, when she reads other stuff I, I write, if, if I get a pil kill the pilgrims, I know what she's trying to tell me. <laughs> but uh, especially on the Sabbath, that was not a particularly positive thing to do. Um, in the South, though, things were a little bit different. The, the Puritans' uh, point of view about uh, leisure activities didn't really take root there quite the same, especially in an agrarian environment where you had you know, the cycles of the year that sometimes were busy, sometimes were not, and that allowed for more of a, of a, uh, a more leisurely culture. And sports, particularly horse racing, uh, was, was part of that. In the industrial north, it wasn't until the immigration waves of the 19th century, which were primarily male, primarily urban, uh, that, you know, what, what do guys that have a lot of time on their hands that are making some money do? They sit in taverns, right? And I, I know that's not necessarily unique to Wisconsin. <laughs> but they sit there and they became uh, uh, a center plate, a centerpiece for entertainment, et cetera, gambling, and, and these uh, taverns would put on boxing matches and racing and all that kind of thing. Uh, mostly to make some money off of selling booze and running the book. Um, but modern spectator sport as we know it, we can really identify baseball as being the first one of those sports. In particular, um, the way that baseball was spread by the Civil War. You had people from all over the country that were two countries at one point, were uh, spending a lot of time with each other. And you know, being in the military is a lot of standing around and trying to keep people busy. They played sports. Um, maybe you've heard the story of Abner Doubleday, supposedly in 1869, having the brilliant idea of laying out the baseball uh, diamond. Uh, it's a great story, and it was invented by largely Albert Spaulding around 1900 because we had to identify baseball as an American sport. Um, but, I mean, if you think about it, how weird is it to think that somebody invented hitting a ball with a bat? I mean, really. And so, uh, it, it, you could probably go forever to find whoever picked up the first 
stick and hit a ball with it. Um, but it was an amateur sport. It was considered uh, kind of ungentlemanly to play professionally. But you might imagine that uh, people want to see this, right? And much as some of the issues we see with big-time NCAA sports, where you have amateur athletes, but tons of money being generated by that, well, there's going to be opportunities for professional play among people who are supposed to be amateurs. And in the late 1860s, right after the war, um, a, the first professional, overtly professional league was organized, the National Association of Professional Baseball Players. Uh, that fell apart because of gambling issues, they didn't have a well-organized schedule, etc. And really the first modern league as we know it is the National League, which was formed in 1876. <clears throat> now, interestingly enough, there's not anything particularly new about uh, women's sports fans. And I found this quote uh, from the 1870s from the Chicago Tribune. And uh, female fans were so far manifested in their interest in the White Stockings, which were the, the National League team, uh, that they traveled to the ballpark alone, <laughs> purchased tickets, and found their seats as if they were perfectly accustomed to this sort of thing. <laughs> and I have a couple of interesting pictures here. Uh, this one is, uh, the one at the bottom is from the Milwaukee Grays, which is a vintage baseball kind of reenactment uh, group. Um, and it, I think it's just kind of a cool picture. Uh, there's the cover from the Take Me Out to the Ball Game music, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then this, I think, is a bachelorette party at, um, in Boston. So I'm guessing that they bought the tickets themselves and traveled the ballpark along. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they had a driver, however. <laughs> right, it wasn't until the 20th century that sports became what we know about them. And just to give you an idea about the big leagues that we think of now, uh, and, and they kind of were founded in a fairly short period of time. Uh, the oldest conference is the Big Ten. It was organized as the Western Conference in 1896. Um, the American League and the National League uh, merged as equals in 1903. The American League was a rival league in 1901. Uh, the NHL became an American sport with the team in Boston in 1924. The NFL, as probably quite a few of you know, uh, 1920 is when that was founded in Dayton, Ohio. Um, the NBA was the uh, result of a merger between two leagues that weren't doing too well. Interestingly enough, the, uh, the NBA came about in no small part because the people who owned the arenas in which hockey was being played wanted to have something going on when there wasn't hockey. And so you find the early years of the, of the NBA were arena owners owning teams that also owned NHL teams. The Chicago uh, is, is an example of this. The Wirtz family, um, who made some money in the distribution business, I believe, in the 1920s. And later, <laughs> uh, uh, owned this team. Uh, NASCAR, there was racing before that, but it became kind of well organized with, in 1948 after the war. And the PGA Tour, due to Arnold Palmer and uh, some of his uh, efforts to try to get more of the money that was being generated to the golfers as opposed to the organization, uh, was founded in 1968, but the PGA itself came into being in 1916. One of the things that I find particularly interesting, and uh, if you live in America now, you realize the relationship between media and sport is what it is, but they grew together. Uh, the invention of the penny press, uh, printing press, uh, made it cheap to make newspapers and changed the model for uh, the newspaper industry in the, the last part of the 1900s. And it's just so happened that college football and baseball were there to help sell papers. It was a really good way to reach the masses, which needed to be done, as opposed to newspapers that were kind of high fluid and for college-educated people, a small minority at the time. But also, we think of baseball's uh, heyday, especially in New York, with the Yankees in the 1920s. Well, that moved right along with movies and radio. Uh, one of the earliest broadcasts, uh, or some of the earliest broadcasts on radio were sports. I mean, <laughs> they had this thing that they, they wanted to sell radios, and they needed content to do it, and sports seemed like a way to do it, baseball in particular. And if you think about the way baseball is today, it's almost perfect for the radio, right? That uh, you can paint, it's a kind of slow moving game, and somebody who is as gifted as Bob Euchre can begin telling the story in the second inning, and he's still going in the seventh inning. <laughs> <laughs> and and you, can, you can capture that. I mean, other sports on the radio are, uh, football's okay, 
racing isn't so good. <laughs> but yet they do have radio coverage of the Indy 500, which is kind of interesting. And of course, television in the 1950s and 1960s, um, the greatest game ever played was the 1958 uh, NFL championship between the Giants and uh, the Baltimore Colts. It went into overtime. It was on television, and it drew incredible ratings. Uh, Johnny Unitas brought his team in overtime to win. It was wonderful, and uh, most people who study this stuff mark that as the beginning of uh, modern television sports. And of course, here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, you know, we know all about the glory days of the 1960s. There was this really interesting mix of things going on there. There was television, color television. There was uh, Pete Rozelle, who was the uh, PR guy who became the leader of the NFL in the late 1950s, early 1960s. There was nothing hotter than being Catholic in the 1960s, right? Remember the singing nun? Remember that? Okay. And you remember, uh, you know, we had, I don't know if this was in all the papers, we had a Catholic president. Okay. And Vince Lombardi representing these, you know, kind of Catholic Midwestern values. I mean, it was all part and parcel of the, of the same thing. It made for great television to have this great uh, dynasty that was happening at the time. All right, let's talk a little bit about how big spectator sports are. And I, I hope you guys can see this. Um, but what we have here are all, uh, all fans, uh, the people that identify themselves as fans, uh, running from the NFL all the way to, to professional lacrosse, which is a growing sport. But there are 142 million people. I don't know if there's anything we can do to make that bigger, but it is what it is. <laughs> uh, 142 million people identify themselves as NFL fans. 120, Major League Baseball. Uh, college basketball and the NBA, roughly about 77, 78 million apiece. The NHL, 61 million. Um, one of the things I like here, 14 million people say that they're professional fishing fans. <laughs> All right? Which is interesting to me. Um, and actually, how many people have actually seen fishing on television? It's awesome! <laughs> I mean, they do a great job. <laughs> It's awesome. It's awesome. You wouldn't think so, but <laughs> that's, that's right. But they actually have contests. You know, whoever has most, and the way that they, you know, kind of slice and dice the production of it. I mean, they really make it seem very exciting. You know, which you wouldn't think. Okay, some guy out there. To me, fishing is not a sport uh, that you do professionally. You do it with beer. <laughs> Okay, a couple of random facts about the media market, which is really the story, I think, in professional uh, sports. Um, in 2009, there were over 43,000 hours of live sports programming on broadcast cable television. That's probably about 50 million now. Or, I'm sorry, not 50 million, 50,000. Um, people watch these things, especially the big events. 100 million, more than 100 million watched the Super Bowl, the last Super Bowl. Um, World Series, which begins tonight, right? How many people, let's say they're baseball fans here, just out of curiosity, a few. How many football fans? Okay, one more, okay. Well, there's a, I mean, literally, there are way more folks that follow the Super Bowl than anything else. It has, the Super Bowl is a remarkable thing, and so far, it's, it's transcended the idea of a sport. It's, it's our January secular holiday. <laughs> <laughs> um, about 8 billion, I think that might be a little conservative, about 8 billion in sports programming, uh, advertising on TV and cable annually. Um, 81 million people per month visit sports websites. This is why there's so many of them. I would argue it's probably the second most popular area of the internet. <laughs> media coverage of sports, which is interesting, media coverage of women's sports outside the Olympics is very, very light. And that's an interesting thing, because as women have increased the degree to which they're fans of sport, they're becoming fans of the big time sports, men's sports rather than women's sports. Women's sports are growing in, in fan base, but it's from a very tiny base. And, and I think that's kind of a curious thing, why, why that would be, the, we'll talk about that a little bit more. All right, what I, and, and this picture we have the annual national network television revenues from various sports. Now, for baseball, big, and basketball too, big chunks of these are actually local television contracts. But these are the national ones. Um, I couldn't put the NFL on there because the PGA, which has about 480 or something like that um, million dollars a year, just let that sink in for a minute, for golf, um, that is dwarfed by the NFL. 
beginning, not next year, next year or the year after, the NFL will be bringing in six billion a year in network television contracts. Now, to give you an idea of what that looks like, that's that's basically 450 there. You need to go to 6,000. So if I put the NFL there, it would be in, on the third floor. <laughs> it's just the biggest thing on television. Um, but there's still substantial money here. You see the college conferences are getting into that more and more. Some of them have their own television channels, even. All right, and so this is kind of very busy, and please forgive me for this, but uh, this is what I could dig up as far as what the latest contracts are. And the ones in red are the NFL contracts. Um, you guys know the Monday night game on ESPN, right? They are paying $15 billion, ESPN is. Now, they're going to have a shot at some playoffs and Super Bowl, but they're paying nearly $2 billion a year, essentially to cover that one game, plus a little bit more. Billion billion dollars, and they think that's a good deal for them. Um, Fox and, uh, and uh, CBS and DirecTV, they are spending about a billion a year, and just under a billion a year for the NBC Sunday night game, which I think is the best probably deal of the bunch, because the hottest property in advertising on television is Sunday night football. That is the top of the, of the heap, is, 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 except for special events. And you see, you know, the Olympic Games is another one. There's a new deal here. You probably can't see this, but um, they're spending over a billion dollars for the next four Olympic Games, 14, 16, 18, and 20, NBC is. And I think that's particularly um, relevant to this uh, audience and what we're talking about here is because the Olympics are probably, if you had to pick a favorite sport of women, it would be the Olympics. I don't know if you call it one sport, but one, one entity. Um, but some of, these, uh, some of these conferences here are making piles of money as well. The SEC, they have a CBS contract, and they have another contract with, I forget, Disney or somebody else. Amazing, okay? Big, big, big money. I mean, $83 billion in contracts are represented here. All of these long-term contracts. $10 billion a year. Wimbledon, let's see, what is that deal here? Wimbledon is NBC, it's $52 million. Uh, overall, they're spending about 10, 10 million a year to do it, which is kind of a bargain, but part of it is because when it's on, let's, I mean, the, the finals are, I think, Sunday morning when people should be at church. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, the, the money there is so big because we care this much. I mean, no one's spending this money if it, if it doesn't bring them something and, you know, it brings eyeballs. So one of the things I find kind of interesting is what are the, what's some of the stuff about the psychology of how we become fans? And uh, I like to compare fandom to religion, and if you're here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, you certainly can see this, right? There's an example. <laughs> Pope Vince, uh, if you're familiar with, uh, he's uh, kind of a, a fixture at, at the games. Um, he, he's really got the look, too. He's got that organ. Um, but in a sense, it is a religion in, in a variety of different ways. If you think about why it is that you are a fan of any particular team, in a sense, you sort of inherited it, in a way. Um, similar to the way that you have political affiliations. They're probably fairly similar to your, your friends and family, your parents when you were growing up, etc. And I, I'm not saying that's kind of passed along in your DNA, uh, actually, there's some evidence that political affiliations actually have some genetic um, manifestations, I guess I should say. But, uh, but that's not true of fandom. But it's your early childhood experiences and exposure. <laughs> See this little one right here, right? That person is going to grow up to be a Packer fan. They will. I mean, I'm a Cubs fan. I don't know why. But part of it is because I don't remember a time where I wasn't a Cub fan. I remember the first baseball cap I got had a little C on it. Um, I grew up in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. My dad had grown up in the, on the south side, and he was reasonably sure that there was something deeply wrong with me because I wasn't a Sox fan. Um, he came around to the Cubs about 1984, uh, but it, he was also a Chicago Cardinals fan, and I grew up you know, kind of a Bear fan. But that's not typical. I have a friend, Chris Bork, he used to be a professor here. He is a Phillies fan, through and through. And when they moved back to eastern Pennsylvania, for some reason his eldest son became a Yankees fan. And I don't think Chris is over it. 
<laughs> There's a particularly important role that fathers play in, in this. And uh, I'm not sure why, it, by the way, this stuff is coming mostly from survey-based evidence, you know, why is it that you're this way? But it, in many cases, especially for those of us that are a little bit older, back before Alan Alda, you know, fathers did not reach out emotionally quite the same way that we expect them to do or that our generation does. And one of the ways that you could connect emotionally with your dad was through sports, okay? There was, some, you know, there was something really important if your dad, who was supposed to be a rock of granite, you know, put on a hat and showed emotion. Wow, you want to get a piece of that. There's also a sense of tribalism, okay? I mean, team colors matter, right? Team logos matter. We're all part of the same tribe, we're part of the same, uh, the same gang. And we talk about we when the team wins and them when the team loses. Uh, but there are all kinds of studies that show that we, we can bask in the reflected glory of the team. Okay? And I think you can just see the mood here. Uh, here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, on a Monday after the Packers win, it's a more pleasant place to be around, right? <laughs> if the Packers lose, remember a couple of weeks ago that you know Seattle game? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry I brought it up. <laughs> but I mean, just remember how the mood was. I mean, if I were a salesperson coming to Green Bay, I would make sure I skipped the days that the Packers <laughs> lost. Just might as well go home. Um, fandom is also an addiction, and when we think about the economics of it, you know, the mathematics of how we, we do this, um, and in, insofar as the more you consume, the more you like additional consumption. Okay, let's think about Dancing with the Stars, okay, which my wife was watching last night. <laughs> and, I mean, I don't care, but, you know, I, I actually can appreciate that more because I've been around it when it's been on, okay? You, you kind of get infected with it, so if you know the storylines, then you appreciate what's happening. Well, it's the same thing with it, especially baseball. I mean, baseball is soap operas. They're soap operas, right? The circus comes to town, and this guy's mad at that guy, right? And this person isn't doing well, et cetera. But, you know, to watch a game and have that context, because you have a history with this team or with this sport, to understand what the cool things are about that makes you want to consume it some more. It's like when you have your first hit of heroin. Right, remember that? All right. <laughs> the more you have of it, the more you want it. And of course, there are some very negative aspects of this. All right, if you ever want to lose your faith in humanity, just go online and look at some of the comments that the Penn State fans were posting when all this stuff was going on around their football thing. I mean, it was unglued, is the best way I can describe it. And it's because they, I mean, their icon, the patron saint of, of their world, Joe Paterno, they could not reconcile what was going on with the kind of image they had of him. It was a very difficult situation and very ugly for reasons other than the, the obvious. All right, there's a bunch of academic research about the differences between males and female fans. And let me just start off by saying there's a lot more similar, similarities than there are differences between the, between the two. Um, but there are some kind of interesting differences which I think are kind of fun to think about. Um, first of all, boys and girls are socialized differently into fandom. Boys, even with Title IX, which has made a humongous difference in the way that girls uh, think about sports and physical activity, um, boys are much more likely to participate even now. Even now. And what's interesting is boys are much more likely to have their sports participation turn into fandom of a particular sport than girls are. Their, their participation, they, they have a wall between that in some ways. Um, and the surveys still show, whether we think this is a good idea or not, sports are still considered masculine. And so boys are more likely to adopt that as part of their persona. Girls don't necessarily bring that in as much. Now I've been involved uh, here at the college with uh, college athletics to a greater or lesser degree for some years, and I, it's definitely different among young girls. But when we look at young girls, I mean 20, <laughs> uh, but when we look at uh, you know the, the bulk of fan bases, they they tend to be older. It's going to be interesting to see what happens as this as the folks who grew up in the second generation of Title IX, what they what they look like with this. Um, there's some there was a 2011 or 2012 paper that came out, which is kind of interesting. And here's what I found curious about this: it got a fair amount of press coverage. Women awful, uh, often follow the sports that are of interest to the men in their lives. 
and uh, it's referred to as relationship maintenance, or in some cases I thought it was sexually transmitted fandom. <laughs> And, and it, what is really interesting is because I think women, uh, well, what, the, what the surveys show and what this research shows is that women tend to look at sports less as a thing in and of itself, but a way to connect with the important people in their lives. Okay, and even if even if you're the most casual of casual fans, all right, the Super Bowl means something. Why? Well, because the family's there, right? That counts for something. You know, Thanksgiving football is. Only, in, only important to a lot of women, I think, men too, but I think to more women, insofar as that all the guys are there, and I haven't seen my uncle and my nephew and all that stuff, and, and to kind of know that they're sitting there on the couch out of kitchen and it's not causing trouble there is, is, a, is a good thing, okay? And, and it's, that surprised me, and there were a lot of folks, uh, women who are avid sports fans, and there's plenty of them, that, uh, that were really upset with that finding. Uh, another thing is that, this may be a surprise to you, but women seem to have less leisure time around the household than men do. <laughs> Who knew? Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, part of it is that, but you know, for men, okay, Sunday, that's appointment television, you're going to watch the game, right? Okay, so that means that you started about 10 o'clock watching the pregame show, all right? When, when you open your first beer is a personal preference, but it's somewhere in that range, right? And you watch all day, and then what do you do at 6 o'clock? You watch all the highlights of the games you just saw, right? <laughs> Women, it's a little bit different. It's less appointment television, maybe because they're busy, they've got other things to do around the house, but they'll kind of watch a piece of it, move away, watch a little bit more of it, okay? Now, I know this is Green Bay, Wisconsin, we're talking about, you know, the Packers, and there is more of that appointment television, but there are differences in these surveys, anyway, that show this. There's some other differences here. <laughs> Women prefer more condensed sporting events. Not the three hour event, but more like a more discreet thing that doesn't last as long, you know, swimming event or uh, something like that. Like what the Olympics do. Similarly, women still prefer more traditionally feminine sports, gymnastics, cheerleaders, uh, cheerleading, figure skating. Again, you know, a lot of these are Olympic sports here. And so it's not a surprise that the Olympics are as popular with women as they are. Males tend to identify more with male athletes than women do with women athletes. Not universally, and I think this is not, I think younger women are starting to identify more with the female athletes. <laughs> kind of funny thing, men will watch a game and be more likely to go out and exercise afterwards. <laughs> women, they don't see it that way. <laughs> female fans react not quite as badly to a, to a loss and for a shorter period of time than, than men tend to. And Here's something else I found really curious. Female fans actually, on average, anyway, according to the research, prefer an outcome of a sporting event that's clearer. The games that are tighter, that go into overtime, are not, they don't provide as much utility for women, which surprised me because you know, we talk about close games and great games, et cetera. And uh, it, it's interesting because that fits in with some other research that very controversial research in, in the economics world about how men and women respond to different types of incentives that are competitive versus not competitive. And uh, I have some colleagues that will not publish papers because they've kind of come up with this, but yeah, seriously, I mean, it's a dangerous thing. But it, that you actually find that when men are put in a competitive environment, they tend to do better uh, on tasks than, they're, than they would on average. When you put women in a highly competitive environment, on average, they tend to do not as well. And you can see why that's a controversial environment that has, uh, that has all kinds of implications for how you set up uh, prize structures. You know, in, in, for men, you want to have you know, first place is much, a much better prize than second, third, or fourth in order to get their best effort. For women, maybe you have a flat, the same amount of money total, but maybe a flatter distribution. But you can see how controversial that would be, and so most of us are staying away from that. <laughs> Okay, about 50 million women, U.S. women, follow sports. And um, the percent of women that say that they're Olympics, fans of the Olympics, 60%, the NFL, 49, Major League Baseball, 43, etc. And one of the differences between males and females is that you'll find that a higher percentage of men than women will say that they spend more time and they're more avid fans. But, you know, 24% of women, a quarter of women, say they're avid fans of the Olympics. 
That's why they cost a billion dollars if you're going to broadcast. Okay, now here's the, these are the fans who are viewed or attended at least one game in 2011, and there are 142 million people that, that viewed or attended at least one game, 60 million female sports fans, female football fans, at least one game, I'm guessing that's Super Bowl if it's nothing else, but it's 42% of the fan base for the NFL is female. And the NFL decided they better start paying attention to that. Major League Baseball, still 40% of their fan base is female. Um, MLS, of all things, it has a smaller fan base, but 40% but, um, of the soccer league fan base is female. Okay, those that went to one game, baseball, because they have many more games, but almost 16 million women went to at least one Major League Baseball game last year. 10 million women went to at least one college football game last year. Um, 7.2 7 million went to at least one football game. And uh, so, I mean, if you look at this, interestingly enough, the highest percentage of the attendees you find is in the NBA, which is 41%, which I would not have expected. Would you find those numbers changing, for instance, MLS? If you looked at that number 10 years ago, before David Beckham came? <laughs> 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 or, I mean, no. Do you see the numbers changing because of like a specific person in the score at all? You know, I hadn't thought about that, but I, for MLS, I wouldn't be surprised if you're right. I wouldn't be surprised. You know, I, think there were, I mean, I didn't know much about soccer, and I'm still not really a fan, but I might watch this again. <laughs> Well, you know, that's. An, I mean, I, I think that I think that's that's probably true. Um, you know, think about the swimming. I think there was uh, some swimmer guy that was uh, a big deal this year in the Olympics. Not Michael Phelps, the other guy. That guy. Okay. I can't help but think that 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 grows some ratings. Okay. I think that does it. Beckham. Um, you know, in baseball, you know, there's always been. You know, in football, it's kind of hard because they have their faces covered and all that. Uh, but in, in some of the sports where they, <laughs> in some of the sports where you can see their faces, I can't help but think that that's a part of it too, and it's more socially acceptable to, to do that. Okay. Your top two females are in hockey and basketball, and what kind of time Oh, that's a good point. That's so a good point. I know where I go. I know approximately when I'm going to be able to meet. <laughs> 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 you know, Terry feels the same way. See, I'm thrilled when, they, when a baseball game goes into extra innings, you know, even though they stop selling beer at the seventh inning, which is, by the way, just completely wrong. Um, but, but Terry's like, let's get out of here. Come on. I saw enough baseball. I saw them all bad twice. Goodbye, right? I think you might be on something there. Okay, the TV viewers by sport, uh, same thing, you know, 42%. Uh, NFL, 41% of college, MLS, 40%. I, I think your David Beckham story is correct, oh, actually. So <laughs> All right, and here's another interesting thing, because, um, you know, I said that men tend to be more avid fans of these sports. They spend more time with it. But we're seeing the most avid of these fans, which are the fantasy sports players, are an increasing percentage of, of women here. And in fact, uh, it, it's a very, you know, we think about, you know, fantasy football players as sort of like pe Dungeons and Dragons for people who played sports in college or high school, right? But um, we find that 15% of the fantasy sports players are women, and that's growing fairly rapidly. Uh, and I'm just curious, any folks here are involved in the fantasy sports league? A couple of you, okay? That's, you would be. Yeah. <laughs> My wife not only runs one, but she regularly wins the ones that she's in. I only beat you a couple times. Yeah, she does, which is kind of embarrassing because I'm supposed to be the sports economist to know how this works, but she cleans my clock. Uh, but you know, another interesting thing about this is if you look at these, uh, the average household income here is, is really high. I mean, if you figure that the average household income in the United States is about 50,000, give or take, uh, at least for men, it's almost twice that. This is a very desirable demographic. and. Uh, one of the reasons why the fantasy sports have done as well as they have on the internet, et cetera, is because advertisers want to get at these folks. And they, look at the time they spend on this. Okay, three hours, two and a half hours, right? And uh, contrary to popular belief, most men who do this are in fact married. <laughs> I don't know how long they'll remain married, but uh, yeah. 
All right, uh, I'm going to wrap it up by talking a little bit about how these leagues market to women. And uh, there's a particular theme, color, coming through here, which is, uh, which is pink. And, uh, you know, the NFL, during the entire month of October, is, you know, doing the pink thing, the Mother's Day thing. Um, the NBA and NHL, a little bit less about this. But for a long time, to the extent that, you know, the, the leagues even were noticing this, you know, shrink it and pink it, right? That's how you make it available for them. So you take the same jersey, make it pink, make it smaller, we'll sell a bunch of them, right? Um, MLB has been a little smarter than most. Now, first of all, Major League Baseball has always had women fans, as I said before. There have been ladies' days. I mean, you know, when I was a kid, I remember that they, those were a long tradition in the 1960s. You know, the half-price Tuesdays for the women to come, come to the ballpark. Um, Baseball especially has emphasized their family-friendly environment going way back, way back. Um, and, uh, you know, we had Marty Ronsky here, and she talked a little bit about this. It's really important to her to make sure, Marty Ronsky is the uh, general counsel for the Brewers and a, uh, an alum of St. Norbert, and uh, she, uh, is really, she really cares about the extent to which that's the case. That's something that Major League Baseball has been doing. They've been selling women's logo apparel since 1989, which is forever in this world. Um, the NFL introduced it in 2000, which seems pretty late, um, but interesting, they have a deal with Victoria's Secret, and there is actually a Victoria's Secret store in the, in the new Cowboys Stadium, it just opened about a month ago. Yeah. It is Texas. It is. And of course, you know, the, in the last few years, the breast cancer branding has been significant, okay? In fact, I suspect that we might be close to a backlash on, on some of that because it seems maybe a little gratuitous at times. I just read an article about the NFL with the branding of the pink in October, and I don't know if it's true, you know, and I don't know what the source is, where it came from, I honestly can't remember the name of me, but they were talking about how it's like so minimal what they're actually contributing, right. mm -hmm. that it's, it's like a half a percentage or something. And then the rest of the profit go right back to NFL because they need a little bit more. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that. Uh, so I was just disappointed to hear that, I guess. I would expect that if they're going to be doing a campaign like that, that they would make it, an effort to have more of the profit go back to. Yeah, they've pinked everything up pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of jarring when you watch it, right? Yeah. In a sense. It's really every, could you no. like summarize what people say? Oh, you sure. Got the microphone. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the point was that the NFL, despite you know all of this uh, uh, attention hype that they spend on on you know supporting uh, breast cancer uh, awareness, etc. Uh, I think what do they call it? The, uh, a great catch, right? Uh, I mean that they really are contributing a very small amount to to this. And uh, there have been numerous news reports in the last little while that report that only five percent of the value of the sales that the NFL has for the, for the pink apparel that they, they're selling are actually going to uh, the American Cancer Society, not the Susan Komen Foundation, but the American Cancer Society, and, and they spend 71% of it on research, so literally $3.24 or something like that of every $100 you spend on that stuff is going to, uh, is going to that. Now, there's a couple of things that the NFL has said is, well, okay, but, um, that they are also raising awareness of it just by virtue of their doing that. And the second thing that they say is that they also are making other contributions uh, to that that are averaging about a million dollars a year for the last few years. So that, that's the, the NFL's official response to that, but I think that's right. You know, you're playing with fire with this stuff if you're not straight on it. But the other thing is, is I mean, it's not only the NFL. I mean, you can go buy Tic Tacs, you can buy gum. I mean, you can buy anything. The pink, the pink thing, to some people, I mean, there it's really, really taken the wrong turn for what it started out, the original intent. Pink became a big business. Yeah. There are studies that are, I mean, it's a backlash. Not, so it's not just the NFL. I mean, yeah. You can buy anything. Did everyone hear that? <laughs> that, that basically, the, the, the pink has sort of jumped the shark in so far as that it's become so... Um, Ubiquitous, it's everywhere. That uh, that it's it's losing its power, and that you know it's actually beginning to become annoying. About it. And I think we're pretty close to that. I think that maybe the the event or the thing that might have 
if you would want to point to a moment, it was probably the last year when the Susan Komen Foundation got into some issues uh, with, with all of that. And I'm not sure if, and maybe, it, maybe someone here knows, I'm not sure if the NFL was always with the American Cancer Society or if they were with Susan Komen and they switched. Were they? They started off they did. They did, okay. And uh, so, which I think is an interesting thing because I think if, just as you say, that if it's pink tic tacs and pink this and pink that, it's kind of reminiscent of the green thing 20 years ago where everything was green, green this, green that, and after a while it just kind of used itself up. And, and that would be unfortunate if that were the, the case here. All right, to, let me wrap it up and talk a little bit about sports licensing here uh, to give you an idea that the retail sales $15 billion a year of logo apparel and other kinds of licenses. $15 billion. Uh, now, the leagues don't make it. They sell their logos as a whole, and they take in, um, the, the major sports leagues and athletes are taking in about half a billion a year in royalties associated with this. It's a pretty nice deal. Okay, and 51% of the retail sales of licensed goods for, uh, for sports-based property, uh, properties that are apparel and caps and that sort of thing. All right, just to give you an idea here, there, uh, there is three and a half billion dollars of expenditures for NFL logo apparel and other things. Three and a half billion dollars of stuff, okay? And of that, not surprisingly, women represent a very big part of that, adult women or teenage and adult women. College football, too, is also over a billion dollars that females spend. So why it took these leagues so long to recognize that, wow, maybe we should market to, to the ladies if they're spending a billion dollars a year was kind of surprising to me. And just for fun, I went and looked this up. I ran across it. I tried to find it for the other ladies. Good. So the biggest selling jerseys for the NFL, this is for last year, Troy Palomalu and his hair. <laughs> Peyton Manning, Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers. Tom Brady, Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow is huge with the ladies, or at least some of the ladies. Miles Austin, the receiver for the Cowboys. Uh, Romo, Witten, and uh, that guy. This guy, double check boy. All right, um, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to try something here. Hope it works. Um, the song Take Me Out to the Ball Game is actually kind of right down Main Street for what we're talking about here. And it makes the point that. Baseball fans, there have been women baseball fans forever. So let's see if I can kind of pull this off here. Thank you. So feel free to sing along if you'd like. On the tables, there are these. Uh, there we go. Fire, he was from all along, good and strong. When 
again, I think that's something that female fans really value is that family together time there, maybe even more than just the actual uh, event. Uh, there's another area that you didn't talk about today in sports that I think is becoming more popular. 20 years ago, there was an organization started becoming an outdoor woman in Wisconsin to start on Stevens Point, which allowed women to go to classes on weekends that usually men uh, were the ones that taught the women, their husbands or something, in archery or hunting or fishing or duck shooting or kayaking and all that stuff. And those classes are all available all year long in a lot of states now because of this woman who started 20 years ago. That's how I became a hunter. I had brothers, I never used a gun because my mother said, women don't do that when I was growing up. And so then I had to wait until I retired from teaching 20, you know, 10 years ago to join this, pro this program and become a, a deer hunter, you know, a goose hunter, a pheasant hunter, and all those kind of things. Through the teaching of those classes, because when you talk to your husband, it's a different whole situation. You're in a lot of different emotions. <laughs> are not always the most patient teachers. <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's a really positive program. And the age is from 18 to whatever, and I'm going there still to classes. And they meet like four or five times a year in Wisconsin, in a lot of states, and it's now international. They go to the Bahamas, they go all over the world. So it's not... Uh, what do you want in the Bahamas? <laughs> Fish. Fish. <laughs> <laughs> Beer hunting. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if everyone heard, but ba basically uh, what Kate brought up was the, the fact that uh, there are many more women outdoors people now than there were before. It's, it's considered acceptable, um, and the percentage of people have grown dramatically because there are opportunities for them to do it. And I'm just curious, are there, I don't know the answer to this, but are there like pink guns and pink, uh, you know, art, that sort of thing? Pink camel? Pink camel. Pink camel, really? Really? Pink camel? At Fleet Farm. You know, I actually was in Fleet Farm not that long ago, and I kind of went to the back where they had the bicycles, and hanging up with some apparel, and I'm not making up, there was a Camo 90 that was for sale there. I don't understand that. Yeah. Okay, uh, other questions before I get myself into trouble? <laughs>